Good evening, everyone. Here, Imran Abbas. Uh, again, we are live. Uh, I am from Dubai, and uh, Professor Nathar Zandal from USA. It is great honor to have uh, such a great personality, and really, it is great honor for myself uh, to interview such a prestigious figure. Uh, so today we will discuss, we will continue our series of uh, uh, safe sleep gastrectomy that we have started in July 2021. So this interview series will finish in December 2021. Then we will have a sum up session. Really, it is great honor. Uh, sir, over to you, sir, please. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I know it's a bit, little bit late for you guys, so thank you for, for being here. And it's, a very, it's an honor for me to be here with you. Uh, sir, it is great honor for us. Uh, so we need, uh, because you know better than me, we have uh, repeated questions. And I will ask uh, same questions because uh, our, what is our target? So at the end of this uh, interview series, we will have some obsession. Uh, so really, sir, it is great for, honor for me, for our viewers. I know you are so much busy because just for uh, coming, if so, uh, so meeting, and that is uh, also responsibility for you. Sir, any message regarding if so? Yes, I mean, remember this was a World Congress that we supposed to do in August last year. It was postponed for March this year, and now it was postponed for October. So we're ready here in Miami to hold it. Uh, yesterday, we heard that they're going to open borders for every country in the world November 1st. So maybe we will accommodate to everybody, and then we will finally, in person, do it the first week of December. But I will confirm in, uh, at the end of this week, after the board meet we have, I mean, a lot of people coming, making efforts. We have very good support from corporations. The agenda looks pretty good. So if we open, I hope as many people can come uh, from everywhere. They open for everybody. Sir, my best wishes and best wishes from our team from Dubai. So hope, uh, definite. I know, I remember when if so was in Dubai, so how much it is, it needs hard work. Uh, for organizing uh, such a great meeting because if so is uh, uh, one of the, uh, so I can ask, so one of the greatest academic activity at this globe, especially for obesity and uh, diabetes, because you know better than me, obesity and diabetes, that is a real pandemic. And nowadays, so I remember when I was a student, so we, because uh, our, we teach about and learn about malnutrition in South Asia, in Africa, but unfortunately nowadays due to lifestyle change, and junk food, the main issue also in adolescent is obesity. Uh, sir, we will go ahead. Uh, so because we have repeated question, uh, sir, your brief introduction. We know, we all have know, but this is protocol of interview. Uh, well, I mean, wh wh who, what I do? Yeah, sir, about your, uh, yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm Colombian, the origin. I was born in Colombia. I moved to the US in, 20, I mean, 1999, I did a transplantation in England uh, for two years, Birmingham and Oxford. And I did transplantation for eight years in Colombia, a liver and kidneys. Oh my God. Uh, then laparoscopy started. So I, I started with gallbladders and then I moved to everything else. I don't reflux, pancreatectomies, esophagectomies, all by laparoscopy. And that's how bariatric started for me, because one day somebody told me that they were doing some bariatric by laparoscopy. That's the only thing that interests me about bariatrics. So I moved to bariatrics because it was, now you can do it by laparoscopy, not the opposite. So, so it was interesting to me. And yes, now that's, that's 1995. So I've been doing bariatrics in 1995. Then I moved to the US and I'm very active in all the societies, executive council of ASMBS. I'm the governor of the college for South Florida. I was the president two years ago. I'm the president of the IFSO Congress. I was president of the IFSO Society 2015. I'm president now of IFSES, that is the Federation for 
la paroscopy that the World Congress is in November in uh, Spain, that has 78,000 surgeons, uh, sages, EAS. So yeah, I'm very much involved in societies too. I have license in five countries. I brought a lot of books and chapters and that's it. Yeah. Sir, great honor. So really it is great honor for me uh, to interview such a great uh, leader. So you also have uh, uh, leadership uh, abilities. Now, sir, you are doing uh, bariatric surgery more than two decade. Uh, so when and why have you started uh, sleep gastrectomy? Oh, well, so, uh, so I started with the band because that was the procedure, it's 1995. <clears throat> then uh, uh, I did like close to 4,000 bands and I proctor almost uh, everybody in Latin America, like 200 surgeons in the US. Uh, but when I moved to the US, we noticed that uh, some percentage of patients were not, I mean, were regaining weight, didn't work. And then in 2001, when Whitgrove did his first bypasses, then we start to move to bypasses. Uh, and finally in 2003, uh, that I did two years of residency in the US to, to get my boards here. Uh, there was a big patient with a big liver uh, in the hospital, they couldn't do it a bypass. So they called me and I did a sleeve and that was my first leaf. And then I've done now like 4,000 of those ones. Too. So, so that's how I moved to the sleep. Uh, but I have very clear indication for every procedure. Sir, excellent. Sir, sir, if we see, so what percentage of your total bariatric surgery practice is a sleep gastrectomy? So, so in total, since 1995, I've done like 13,000 cases, maybe 14 now. Uh, I would say 4,000 is a bands, 4,000 is a sleeve, uh, 2,000 and something their bypasses, and the rest is revisions. 50% uh, of what I do now is revision, either for complications or weight regain. So whoever have a problem somewhere, I ended up having this patient the second time, the third time, the fourth time. So I spend most of my time now in revisions. Yeah. Sorry. And endoscopy. I do a lot of endoscopy. We have a very good group of uh, endoscopic procedures for bariatrics. Sir, excellent, sir, excellent. So what's my question? So regarding this uh, technique, because you know better than me, so now about two decades, uh, uh, you are doing uh, uh, sleep gastrectomy. And as you have mentioned, uh, so the main uh, practice is revisional or redo surgery. And you know better than all of us. So about uh, uh, complications and also a long time complication. So what is my question regarding evolution of your technique of a sleeve gastrectomy? So because when you started about two decades ago, yes, that was a sleeve. And now in 2021, uh, you have definitely you have changed your technique to decrease chance of that complications like leak, like bleeding, like weight regain, get after a sleep. So, sir, can you mention that points, highlight that points that you have changed during this period? You see that, that you're not going to like my answer because, because I did transhiatal esophagectomies before I created tubes with the stomach before the sleeve. Oh. So the technique I was using for that is what I use now. So I haven't changed it because our leaks is almost non-existent or bleeding is almost non-existent. So I use the same and I'm not gonna change. Some of the things I'm gonna say can be controversial, but I use a bougie of 34 or 36, no more than that. I always stay away of the incisura angularis and I always stay away of the angle of his at least half centimeter. And then I oversaw all the suture line with non-absorbable suture. I know that's controversial, but I've done, as, and I mentioned again, close to 4,000 or maybe a little bit more now. And I don't have one leak or one bleeding. I'm gonna get them, but I, I don't change the technique. So when you ask me what I change, I only change that. I move from a, a bougie that I can move to a bougie that I can suck air and collapse the stomach. That is much better. I move, so moving the bougie 
every stapler. I change some of the caliber of the stapler because you don't have it anymore. Uh, I don't even change the energy I use. So when something I happy and standardized, I don't change it anymore. So, so regarding your first stapler, so how much this distance from pylorus? Depends. This is what I do. I trace an horizontal and a vertical line. So I trace an horizontal line in the lesser curvature, okay? And then an horizontal line from the pylorus. So if from this line to this line is less than five centimeters, I start exactly there. If it's less than five centimeters, I also start there. So some antrum is only four centimeters or five. If it's more than six, then I go backwards to the antrum. Then I use my left hand for the first stapler. So I try to keep between five and four and five centimeters my antrum. But I don't go crazy going to two or three. I tell you why, because if you see the studies, the more you remove antrum, the weight that you gain, the loss weight that you gain is like 6%, 4%. But the complications you get, they increase like 6 7%. So I don't do that. But if it's more than six, five, six centimeters, and if you don't remove that, your weight loss is going to be very bad. So, so that's, that's the only thing I do there. Sir, have you any video of your technique? I'm sorry? Have you any video, video of your technique? Re redo? Any video of your technique? Uh, uh, are you interested to show your video? Oh, let me see. You want me to show a video now? Yeah, yeah, if you... Let me see if I have one. I usually have everything. Let me see what I have. I'm going to open this very quick. I'm going to do this presentation, OK? OK, sir. Can you see it? Yeah, sir, we can see. OK. So for me, the most important is what not to do. So don't select the patient wrong. I don't do patient with significant reflux. I don't do diabetes in those seven years that you can still cure them. This is my trocar placement. And as you notice, I use 212 because I like to fire the face stapler from the right side of the patient. And then the other ones that they are straight. I know people force it and curve. I don't, I don't like to force. I, I, for my patients, 212 doesn't change any aesthetics or anything. So I put 3.5, 212. Then I always start with the G junction. I stay away from the angle of his. Then I go from the pylorus. I'm staying very away to enter the lesser sac. I think this is the other big mistake. People try to force the entrance. If you're still going up, in the greater curvature, the opening will come by itself and then you can come back if you need. So you don't need to force the entrance. Uh, stay close to the stomach. Uh, do not staple close to the scissura. So what I do, I see, I put my stapler as I like it. And then I move away from the scissura, the tip one centimeter. So that, that's what I do. And then I do the same in the angle of his. Why? Because all the sling fiber for reflux, they are there. I don't destroy them. That's what I oversaw too, because I have, I leave a little, little fundus and then I imbricate it, but the sling fibers are still there. That's what our incidence of reflux is 2%, not 20%. So, so our incidence in reflux is very good. That's why we leave this dog here in the last fire. Okay. Also, when we staple, your assistant has the tendency to, to push hard. And usually to push hard, they either grab anterior or posterior the stomach. I tell them, you grab the yellow. The yellow is the fat. So you, you grab from the curvature. You don't grab anterior or posterior because once you fire with tension, you end up having kinks and that's a problem. The shape is very important to me because I think it's the second cause of reflux as is published here. And then uh, I used to do endoscopy in all of them at the beginning, because what you're gonna see here is you're gonna see that this patient that they sent to us, in the scope, 
you don't see the light. You need to start to twist that when you have that, you have a king. All kings that I receive from other services ended up in total gastrectomy. So I'm very concerned about the kings or restriction like these ones, you know? So this, the patients ended up in big search. So let me see. I don't know if this video is old or no. So I hope it's, it's a good one. So you can, you can have it. Uh, as I mentioned before, I start, I don't force the opening. Uh, then I keep going very close to the stomach, except when I arrive to the short gastric, I stay a little bit away from the stomach. And then difference that everybody, I leave the whole stomach. And then as you see here, I'm staying away from the, from the incisura. I'm gonna advance a little bit. Then I change to the other trocar. And this is something important what I presented there. You know, and let me see if I can show it again, because for me, this is very important. Every fire that I'm gonna do, I look anterior and posterior, and I need to have the same amount of tissue anterior and posterior. Some people think that if you have enough tissue of the stomach posterior or anterior, you are safe. This is not true. You need to have the same amount because when you have the same amount, you are not doing kinking, you are not changing your firing line. When you don't look posterior and anterior, like I do every fire and I do the same. I look anterior and I look posterior. Now you notice I change my hands. And then my assistant is pulling from the fat. I don't like to create a lot of tension. And then finally I use blues. I start with green, I move to gold, and then I do blues. I haven't changed that. Never, unless some hospitals that I go, they only have the purple ones. And then I'm more concerned because if the stomach is not that thick, you can have some bleed. Look the dog gear that I'm leaving there. That one, I'm gonna suture and close. And I don't go through the staple line. I don't know, I'm gonna repeat this again. Remember I mentioned, I'm gonna imbricate that. Uh, that's how I do it. Yeah. With non-absorbable. With non-absorbable. Yeah. This is an etibond or? I use etibond 2 yeah. And then I go very close to the staple line without going through the staple line. I think if you go through the staple line, you cause a necrosis. And I think if you go far away from the staple line, then, and during this, uh, during this uh, suturing or embigating, so this uh, bougie is inside the... All the time, all the time. Even if I'm going to repair a hiatal hernia, that I only repair if they are bigger than two centimeters, if no, I don't repair. I repair the hernia with the bougie in place. I think the bougie will prevent to do things badly. If you remove the bougie during the suture, you can... Uh, to the posterior one. This, this clip that I'm gonna show you, if you want me to, there are five clips of complications that I've seen on patients that I received from other people. So make sure that all tubes are out, not only the NG tube. Look at this, what is that? Temperature Pro. So they forgot, this is one of my partners, call me, because he has the NG tube to be removed, but he forgot to remove the temperature Pro. And now you can see here, you have the temperature probe in half. And what you need to do with those ones? You need to remove them. You know, you need to now remove them, create an opening. And now every time you create an opening, you, you know you need to close it, no? So if you're lucky, you still have portion of the stomach to staple again. If not, you need to close this by hand. And then you can start to create uh, strictures. So as you can see, the other side of the temperature probe, I don't care because that's gonna go away with the sleeve. But this one, I need to remove. And you know, there is a hole in the stomach already. Yeah. Because that's the temperature probe. So 
I cut this part that I don't want to go back and then they pull it from there. And then now I need to close this one. If there is a space like in this one, I, I fire again. If there is no space, then I need to suture by hand. Okay. The, set, the next one is very scary one. What is this? Do you see that? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah bougie is there. The anesthetic push the bougie. Exactly. So all, 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 all the time, one of my junior residents called me, and this is a scary thing when you said the bougie, this guy was so lucky that this was, as you can see here, in the fundus. Yeah. And they did something stupid. They took it back. You don't take it back until you are ready there to grab both yeah. sides. Yeah. So this is just because they're young and inexperienced. So you don't remove that, that probe. Look, they were lucky. It's away from where I'm going to staple. But if it's in the, in the sleeve, maybe you ended up doing a gastric bypass. Uh, so you have to be very careful with, with the bougie. Also, this I show you that the new bougies that I use, the new bougies that I use, they soak the air, so they stay there. They don't move. But in the past, I review if they move or not. Look at this one. You think that the bougie is there, but it's not. You see that it's not there anymore. Yeah. So every yeah. time I'm going to fire, I always check again that the bougie is there. Now, I don't have that problem because the bougie uh, is, is going to be fixed by there. Uh, this is the bougie. I mean, if you don't mind, I'm going to show you. This is the bougie we suck, and now you can have it. Uh, and I think it's very good for us because they have, they suck me all the things that we have. And you can see here how we create the sleeve with that bougie. The bougie is there, you suck the air. And it's not gonna move. And you know what is interesting? It sucks the same amount of tissue anterior and posterior. So this bougie does, once you place it there, you ask the anesthesiologist to suck, it's not gonna move from there. Look how beautiful it collapsed and give you, this is a revision. When it's a revision, I use a, Reinforce. Exactly. Also, this is a case that was sent to me from another country. This is a patient just after surgery, very sick, vomiting. Uh, and then you notice what happened is they didn't divide the whole fundus. So we needed to go back and finalize that one. I know you're going to ask about leak test, so we we'll do it later. So I'm going to finish here. I hope that is that yeah, is yeah, uh, sir, definite, sir, definite. There was a great message, especially this uh, uh, embrication or that you embricate the all the sleeve. And in my opinion, this is great for message for our youngsters, uh, especially for youngsters, because now more than four thousand cases and there is no leak, no bleeding. So this is a great message, sir. What is your opinion regarding uh, omentopexy? Uh, you're not going to like also this, uh, this is what I'm going to tell you. So the omentopexy doesn't prevent anything. You did your kink, the kink is there. You did a stricture, the stricture is there. Some people try to fix it to the pancreas, then you get pancreatitis. Then some people fix the omentum. I'm going to tell you what I think about the omentum. The best example is a cut in the litter. Okay, so the cat does shit and cover it with sand. The shit still there. So it doesn't matter how much you cover with the omentum, put the omentum. If you create a kink, the kink is there. If you create a stricture, the stricture is there. If you put the omentum and that's let you sleep well, then use it as a sleeping pill. But otherwise, it's worthless. And there are two randomized studies from Momentum, no difference. But in the group of the Momentum, there were two bleedings from vessels in the Momentum. So, so I, I don't use it. I don't think it's worth it, but I'm not going to fight it. I mean, I don't I, think it does much harm, you know, but I, I don't think it, it worked for anything. Sir, regarding post-op endoscopy protocol, because you have mentioned in all of your patients, 
so you prefer to do uh, um, this gastroscopy before surgery but what is your protocol after sleeve gastrectomy have you any protocol yes we 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 that we change our original protocol is endoscopy for all bariatric patients all of them they got endoscopy before surgery then in surgery in the us is a standard of care to do a test there are three tests you should do one either you do water and air or you do blue methylene or you do endoscopy you need to do one of the three if you don't do them that some don't do if you have a lawsuit you didn't do the standard of care okay in the post op i do x ray to all my patients all of them for two reasons they take them to x ray so my patient walk away from the bed second i like to see how my sleeve look if they come back in a year i know the size of my sleeve because i never seen a leak the next day but that's what i do and then we were not doing anything else uh two years ago we start to do endoscopy every year and the reason is we want to know our real incidence of esophagitis reflux etc so now we are doing every year but i think the conclusion at the end will be that you should do one a year then the next one at 3 years the next one at 5 i don't think you're going to need any every year unless you have a problem you do the first year then you move to the third year and then you move to the five but i think it will be become a protocol to every single service in the future if you want to know your barrets and you want to know your reflux sir uh, what is your percentage of follow up because definitely you are following after one year after three and five so uh, what is your percentage how many patients uh, you are following a 50 60 70 no even in the cleveland clinic that raul rosenthal just published a little by ago sometimes your follow up at 3 and 5 years is 5% 10% we, we have 15 one five uh, at 5 years and we have like terry at 3 years this is, is these patients they they disappear if they're doing well they disappear yeah. if they're not happy some of them come back and the other ones they disappear and go somewhere else. so it's not easy with endoscopy i think we're going to see more of our patients uh, in the five years so the follow up will improve too yeah, yeah. Uh, sir uh, so, so because earlier you have mentioned so one of the most important thing in bariatric and especially in a sleeve gastrectomy is patient selection uh, so we like to hear more about uh, this uh, uh, patient selection so what is uh, so this uh, relative and uh, Uh, so absolute contraindication of sleeve gastrectomy and which patient is good for sleeve gastrectomy yes you i learned that i don't say full contraindication because every time i say this is a contraindication somebody jump so i call them no indication so i have this no indication for a sleeve significant roof reflux is a no indication for a sleeve diabetes of less than 7 years is not an indication for the sleeve hiatal hernias of more than 5 cm are no indication for the sleeve uh, that's basically my 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 no indication for the sleeve you know so otherwise there's no problem to the sleeve sir age is not necessary so in a adult sense uh, no it's age not i mean we've done we've done i think my my youngest patient with the sleeve is uh, 14 my youngest patient with a band was 9 uh, so i don't have contraindication by age no i have contraindication by age for bypasses yes i don't do bypasses in young and i don't do bypasses in seniors i think it's too much for any of those two groups it means you prefer sleeve gastrectomy in young age as well as in old age Yes, unless they have one of the problems I mentioned before. Yeah, definitely, sir. Uh, some something that is the most common. So because in obesity, uh, so this uh, uh, GERD symptom, because you know better than me, GERD is a wide uh, definition. So we cannot. Uh, uh, so uh, especially uh, this GERD. So just symptoms. So when when you do uh, endoscopy or gastroscopy, yes, there is no esophagitis. There is no reflux. but patient complains uh, uh, this gerd and you did uh, sleeve gastrectomy 
But situation become worse after a sleep gastrectomy. Had you any experience, such an experience? I have, I have this concept about uh, the reflux. If the patient has symptoms, I'm gonna get the scope. If the patient doesn't have symptoms, I'm gonna get the scope. Because there are a lot of patients that they have something without the scope. I pay more attention to this. I pay attention to patients that have uh, been taking medication, not occasionally, because we know that 40 something percent of our obese patients, they have reflux. So that's no contraindication or, or no indication, but if they've been taking, if they've been having three or four endoscopies in the last years, if they've been taking a medication from their GIs, that's history. Those patients are gonna have impedance, pH studies, and manometries. So, and then I will decide. Uh, if the patient has esophagitis, it can be B or C. I know people say C, no. For me, if I B, I'm just gonna ask for studies. And then I will decide if I add esophagitis B with pH studies, manometry, I don't like it, I'm not gonna do a sleep. And the other thing I consider very important is extraesophageal symptoms. Because some of our patients, they are asthmatic, or they have dysphonia, or they have sinusitis, and we blame other stuff. Every patient that I think has extraesophageal, because endoscopy will be normal in those patients, they're going to go to pH studies, and they're going to go to impedance and manometry. Thank you, sir, really. And this is also a great message. So if someone with the symptomatic GERD is a not good candidate for a sleeve gastrectomy, maybe in future, so the, sir, regarding hiatal hernia, because you have mentioned, so if hiatal hernia is more than five centimeter, centimeter, you never prefer, but if there is four or five centimeter, are you prefer to repair crura, cruroplasty or hiatoplasty or no, you will not touch? This exactly, this is what I learned too. Any hernia that is, if I go to the OR, the hernia is less than 1.5 to centimeters, and the angle of his is inside the abdomen, I don't have a problem. I do the sleeve. When I finish the sleeve, now I check posteriorly. And if I confirm it's 1.5 centimeters, I don't do anything else. If the hernia is up to four centimeters, then I repair it posteriorly, but I repair it after I do the sleeve because now I know better the real size of the hernia. If the hernia is more than five centimeters, you need to understand that more than 50% of those patients, if you don't put a mesh, the hernia is gonna open in the first year, more than 50%. So, we publish gastropleural, gastrobronchial, and gastropericardial fistulas. And every time you watch the video, it's because the hiatus was too big or they didn't close it. So the, the, the leak happened in the chest. Yeah. And I'm much more scared of a leak in the chest than a leak in the abdomen. So every patient that I do surgery, primary of revision, I ask them for consent to change the operation according to what I find. If they don't authorize, I don't do the bypass. If they authorize big hernia, I move to a bypass because the, the bypass itself is anti-reflux. So, 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 so that's what I do. I know it's, again, again, it's controversial, but it's, it's my own experience and I'm not gonna change it. Yeah, definitely, sir, because this is very nowadays, so you know better than me, the main, Topic is a complication after a sleeve gastrectomy, and one of the hot topic is GERD after a sleeve gastrectomy. So regarding weight regain, which percentage of your patients, now more than 4,000, you did a sleeve gastrectomy, and also you have mentioned, so most of the patients, they disappear because they are fine and there is no issue, but definitely you are following your patient. Which percentage of your patients has weight regain during these two decades? In the ones that we follow, we have like 17%, one seven percent of weight regain. But I have two different types of, of, of weight problems. One is the one that no weight loss at all. 
And the other one is the one who lost very well and now regains. And we do something very different. If you never lose weight and you have a sleeve, the bypass is worthless. We did 30, no weight loss. Bypass and the sleeve primaries, they have very similar restrictions. So if the, if the sleeve didn't work and there is no reflux, we convert them to SADIS. So I think SADIS for me is a revisional surgery after the sleeve with no reflux that never lose weight. But if the patient lost weight five years later, six years later, the sleeve is dilated again, the patient regained weight, the bypass is gonna be okay. Or if the patient has reflux, we do bypasses. So, so that's how we revise the patient. It's good, sir. Sir, sir have you any other video want to show? Of what? Regarding any complication or if you have any message for our youngsters, because they must know also this sleeve is not simple as uh, apparently they can see, but there is also some technical points they must follow. Let me see what I have here. Can you see this one? Yes, yeah, sir, we can see. Okay, so failure is very difficult to define because it's not really defined. There are difference between weight loss, weight regain, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Look at this, this is, look at the difference in the sleeve. That's the other thing with the bypass, you, are, you don't have this 43 to 83, you know, with the bypass, you have very similar numbers. Here is a big difference in the number. And the reason are many, how you do it, the patient, etc. So I'm gonna move quickly here. So this is the option we had for this patient. So what do you want to know before you decide what to do with this patient? The anatomy is dilated or is a normal sleep. But you also need to understand that there is no good definition of dilated or normal. So that's very difficult to decide. Mine, I compare what I had before. If, if there's something else you want to know, yes. As I mentioned before, you don't lose weight or you regain weight. That's changed my approach. So there are groups who did re-sleeve gastrectomy. I don't do that. But if I have patients that had a biliopancreatic diversion or they have a sleeve before with any kind of bipartition, etc., I re-sleeve the, the fundus because there's nothing else I can do from malabsorption because they have it already. So you can re-sleeve some. I know everybody likes to show the easy videos. I like to show the real ones because everybody who tell you that revise is easy, they don't know what they're talking about. It's full. When you revise, the only color you see is red. Dark red, alive red, red bleeding, red thrombo. So look how how revision it really is. So you need to be very careful there. So you go revise, uh, even that you have a sleeve, you're gonna find some additions that look like the sleeve is still there, but it's not, it's the, the, the new, and this is meant to go by itself. And look how big was that uh, sleeve. Can you see it here? Yeah. So then we, we pass a bougie and then we re-sleeve. But this is a patient with a DS, a biliomacratic diversion, that they use a 60 French bougie. So now we are re-sleeving because the malabsorption is already there. So this is where we gain after biliopancreatic diversion or something else. We did this in a couple of patients, but I don't do this anymore. And you're gonna see what they did. We did plications. But what I do, and I want to show this, I always go and revise again the hiatal hernia and look at the, when you have the fundus again. This, you can, you can trim, you know what I'm saying? This one you can trim. You close the hiatus. Now we are using barb sutures. You have barb sutures in, in, in the Emirates? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we use barb sutures. And as I mentioned before, every time I revise, I use biosynthetic material. That's a difference of what I do in primary. Primary, I never used it. In revision, I use them. And then you can trim. That's the only time I do those cases. You have any other option? This, we did. 10 cases of this, but I don't do it anymore. 
this what I think this froze. Yeah. I think it froze. Let me see if I can. I'm still sharing the screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we did plication. I know it's a, some people do this. I'm going to show how we do plications, but I don't do this anymore. And if you see this sleeve is not that big. What is big is the antrum. They leave the antrum big. So what we're going to do is a plication that will include the antrum, okay? With a bougie in place. I don't do plications anymore. We, we saw a lot of problems with plication that we received from many places, but I'm showing you how we did our plications. Two lines with non-absorbable suture. I don't do that anymore. And then you can convert them because if you think everything went fine, no, it's bad things can happen. So you convert it to a bypass. And this is my indication. If you have reflux, strictures, or you regain weight, you convert it to a bypass. With reflux, strictures, and non-weight loss, we don't do it. And again, I can show you the real revisions. You can see here, you go to the lesser curvature and then you are in trouble, but you have to go. This is something that I changed, uh, Professor Abbas. I yeah, change. Sure, sir. Now I'm go to the greater curvature. I don't start in the lesser curvature anymore. And that's what I'm gonna show you later. And here we're doing a bypass, like a regular bypass, I think. Okay. So this is what we do now. Approach from the side. Excellent. So I go to the greater curvature that the additions there are nothing. And then at the end, we gonna fire from there to here. It's a good, excellent. Sir. It's much easier. Yeah. Less problematic. And then we're gonna trim, of course, with that bougie uh, for the bypass. And this, when you have a structure like this one, then I'm gonna go very high do the bypass and the rest of the stomach until the pylorus, I take him out. As the picture I show at the beginning, remember the picture I show with that specimen? So when there is a stricture, I'm gonna change it like this. And then I do my bypass in a regular way. And that's it. To the S for no way regain, as long there is no reflux, because it was designed like that. So if you ask me for revision of the sleeve, we still have much more questions than answer because we don't know enough. And that, that will be my opinion. We don't know enough of that. Sir, excellent, really excellent message for our youngsters, especially uh, who are uh, new in this field and they must be careful because uh, so we don't have such a person like you who will uh, so cover this these complication because redo surgery is much, much difficult than initial surgery. So, sir, my question regarding plication, because uh, I am also uh, so follower of uh, plication and in favor, and also now uh, uh, um, one of my practice is uh, gastric plication with ileal bypass, uh, that we call uh, it uh, stepless sassy. Uh, so it's good surgery, sir. So if you do, when, when, when you will add this ileum, or this loop to entrum, then this is a low pressure and uh, you add this uh, uh, hypoabsorptive component and actually now about five years, I have follow up of my patients, especially in low BMI cases. Yeah, I mean, placation I don't do anymore. Placation is gone from my practice. I don't do placation anymore. I did like 40, I was not happy, so I didn't do it anymore. I saw a lot of hernias, I saw a lot of vomit. Uh, I get three patients from another country that they necrosed the stomach to one of these hernias. I did two life cases for Michel Gagné course from Mexico to New York of revision. It take you two and a half hours, three hours to undo the application, to do it. It's, it's not that easy and, and I'm not sure it's worth it. That is, that's the biggest problem for me. I don't know if it's uh, worth it. Maybe. But so there is some technical. Uh, I agree with you, sir. Sir, regarding, sir, good after a sleeve gastrectomy, that is the also main issue. What is the percentage of your patient who are suffering with GERD after a sleeve gastrectomy? Definitely your patient selection 
is uh, very accurate and you prefer to do sleep gastrectomy in a patient without uh, GERD symptoms, uh, your patient are suffering also after sleep gastrectomy in such a situation? Yeah, I mean, if our patients can have reflux, but the reflux related to obesity, that you know that when you lose weight, it's going to improve. That the patient that go to a dinner, uh, take some mylanta or something, you know, that, that patient is not contraindication, but the real reflux, it is contraindication. So we have, with the patient selection, with not dissecting the one or two centimeters hiatus and make it big, without doing the more than five centimeters and without, I mean, being very careful in the shape of our sleeve, we have 2%. And 2% is very acceptable to us, you know, because in the bypass we have 0.6%. So, so 2% is acceptable to me. 20%, 15 is not acceptable. Sir, one of the issue in obesity is NASH or Nefeld. So the definite is a great issue. And nowadays, one of the reason of the so liver transplant is NASH. So NASH and cirrhosis and then so... So if, have you any criteria for such a, because for patient selection, if patient is cirrhotic, uh, so are you uh, prefer a sleep gastrectomy definite as compared to? No, no, depends which level of cirrhosis they have. If this is a patient that gonna end up in a transplant, a sleep gastrectomy I prefer, but you need to be careful of the portal hypertension because portal hypertension can cause problems when you do a sleep. Uh, can cause problems in the abdominal wall of the patient. Uh, but I rather do a sleep than a bypass because I don't like the connections when you're gonna do a liver transplant. You know, we're gonna, repair, we're gonna reconnect the, the, the coleducos or the common bile dog, the patic dog. So, so I don't like it. Also, there is a couple of papers that tell you the bioabsorption of the medications with the bypass can be irregular. There are reports at least of three cardiac patients that die uh, and the heart fail after transplant because the bioavailability of the medication was not very good with the bypass. So I think anyone who's going to a bypass, sleep is better if there is no portal hypertension. So, so I would say with cirrhosis, I'd rather use sleep. Sir, have you any experience? So patient was cirrhotic and you did uh, any type of bariatric surgery and after that, so this uh, cirrhosis uh, improves and now there is no need uh, to go for uh, liver transplantation. No, that, no, but there are some patients that at the beginning very stage when they have a very deep uh, uh, fat infiltration of the liver, uh, if you do some bypass on them, the liver improves, the liver improves, but no cirrhosis, cirrhosis, they don't improve much. I think the changes that cirrhosis bring to the liver, they are irreversible, but the pieces of liver that they are normal or they are just getting in cirrhosis, those ones you can improve. Uh, that, that, that's, that's what I think. So excellent. Sir, one of the issue after a sleep gastrectomy is the portal vein thrombosis. Have you faced such a situation and how can we prevent? Yeah, I mean, we haven't seen it in gut in a sleep. I saw it in bypasses when I was resident here in the US. Uh, and it was more or less related to two things. One, some problem in the coagulation factors. And second, hydration. So the only way to really prevent them is very good hydration and don't dissect that close to the splenic vein because I think that manipulation can be, but the best prevention will be the anticoagulation we give in the room and very good hydration. Sir, regarding hydration, because routinely we discharge the patient uh, just next day, are you prefer any IV uh, fluids after discharge? So sometimes I prefer uh, my patients, they consult on daily basis to clinic one liter, so this, uh, any ringer or something like this, are you also prefer? No, I mean, I, for me, it's the same. Uh, a long is not a sideline, everything is the same. What, what I mean, what is important is well, our patient stayed 23 hours in the hospital. So if the patient uh, surgery was 8 a.m., 
his x-ray will be at six and then the patient will be ready to leave at seven. So what I do is as soon as the x-ray looks good, they start to drink very small portions and then we send them home and we make sure that they drink one of these ones. All of them follow up by the nutritionist the first week, every day they call them. Have you drink this? Did you drink your quantity? And I think that you need to push the patients not to get, because if they feel full, they forget to, the next half an hour, the next hour, they forget the drinking. Uh, and, and that's very important, walking and drinking. Yeah, yeah. Sir, regarding PPI after surgery, because uh, again, this is related to GERD after surgery. Uh, so have you any protocol and how long time you prefer uh, for your patients? Two months, two months to every bariatric procedure. Any, even Any. when I do endoscopic surgery, two months. I do sleeve, two months. I do bypass, two months, all of them. Uh, if my patient of the sleeve has a little bit more nausea the first week that I expected, I leave them three months because that means that that patient maybe is a little bit tight. So, I mean, nausea the first 24, 48 is normal, but after that, maybe the sleeve is a little bit tight with higher pressure then I leave them for three months. Sir, excellent. Sir, regarding this endoscopic uh, gastroplasty, because I think you have a uh, uh, excellent experience. So but yeah, I mean, I, I, part I participate in the initial trials where we did a lot of the patients in Dominican, Panama. We publish it. Uh, I only train to do them, and I know how to do them. But then I leave it to the younger guys. Or some person like Albao, that they, they do it all the time. Because for me, it's a little bit of waste of time and money for the hospital. Because I do sleep in 30 minutes, uh, you do bypass in 35, 40 minutes, and then it takes you almost an hour to do this, and the payment is not that good. So I I'm to learn it. Yeah, sir, sir, uh, I have a, I have a political question, also technical and political, because you are a most responsible person, uh, also in so and also in this at this globe, in my opinion. Uh, so regarding this uh, mini gastric bypass or varanostomosis gastric bypass, uh, especially in redo surgeries. So when a patient wait again after a sleeve gastrectomy and you prefer sadi and you know better than me, sadi is technically a little difficult. I did some cases. So when you do so dissection of duodenum and D1 and also then because all of my cases I see a cyanotic appearance of that part of duodenum and I was scary. So what will happen? Uh, fortunately, there was no issue, but apparently it is little difficult to dissect that area and also staple D1 and then anastomosis of, uh, so this the loop of ileum or jejunum with D1. Uh, but if we compare with uh, uh, this uh, mini gastric bypass uh, that is much easier than sadi i only done four mini gastric bypasses or one anastomosis gastric bypass the four of them for the same situation all of them revisional when i have a low stricture after the sleeve i don't want to do a bypass high so i go to the low strictures and then i do the one anastomosis gastric bypass and the results have been good and only, the only concern I have with the one anastomosis gastric bypass is, uh, of course, the reflux, because the people who did it very often, they say it doesn't happen, but I've seen patients that happen, and I've seen patients that they get it. So I think now that some groups are, are doing seriously, when new publications come, I think it's going to gain another different step in the world, and more people will do it, I think so. Uh, I think in the US will be studying now and probably will be approved in a couple, in a year or so, because now, you know, in the US is experimental, but sadly it was approved last year. So, so we'll see, we'll see what happened with that. So, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, really, it was a great, uh, especially learning session for me 
for myself as well as for our viewers sir any message for my youngsters who are just now going to start a sleep gastrectomy regarding to what safe sleep gastrectomy what they must do for a safe sleep gastrectomy yeah select the patients well uh, do your first 20 or 30 patients with someone do do, do your first 20 patients by yourself with low BMIs and no previous surgery. You don't need to do the most uh, tight sleeve. It's not gonna change much. So use bougie 36, 38. You don't need to go that close to the bougie. You can go close, but no, no bleaching because that is very bad. Every time before you fire, look posterior, anterior, Remember that once you fire, you don't have reverse. Before you fire, you can change the position of your stapler a hundred times. So you put there, you look posterior, you look anterior, you're not happy, you open it, you put it again. You're happy, you fire. Uh, and then uh, make sure of the shape you leave it and put the patients in liquid diet two weeks before the surgery and two weeks after the surgery. And that will help you to get a better stomach when you operate and less complications with the patient in the post-op. Sir, so much thanks. And I know you are so much busy and especially due to coming if so Congress, uh, that is a biggest show of if so and uh, such an academic activities and definite uh, we all will be your guest in Miami. I uh, hope when uh, it will be finalized and soon uh, we will hear from your side. So much thanks sir, for your time and uh, really appreciable. And also we need your support and guidance. And this series will, this series of interview regarding safe sleeve gastrectomy will be end in December, 2021. And we will have a sum up session. And definitely again, uh, we will disturb you and we need uh, your support. And next year we will go for Ruan Vai Gastric Bypass, then uh, also for uh, metabolic surgery in low BMI in 2023. Uh, so we will continue redo surgeries and definitely again. Uh, so we need uh, your help and your guidance. So much thanks, sir. Shukran, thank you very much for the invitation. So. Have a good night, you guys. I'm, I'm just starting my afternoon. So have a good one. So my thanks and so my thanks, uh, viewers that are till this time and especially in South Asia, now midnight. Uh, so my thanks. We need your support. And also we will continue our interview series. And next week we will be with another legend of bariatric surgery. Have a nice time. So thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.